Hello, everyone. Hello, Jord, and hello, Mark. Thank you for joining us this evening. How are you tonight, Jord? I'm not too bad, thanks, Phil. How, how are you? Yeah, good, good. good. Good to have you on, Mark, as well. Yeah, good to see you both, and uh, evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Tonight, we're, we're going to be uh, thinking about Psalm 27, and just to bring us up to, to speed... Um, We'll go to our trusted uh, river slide that we always begin with. Um, and um, we're still in book one. We are, as we've said previously, um, in the Psalter, a little bit over halfway now, aren't we, in book one, Phil? Um, mm. And I think we're going to possibly see some of um, this aspect of steadfast love that we uh, that we looked at a few weeks, well, probably a few months ago now, um, in one of our sessions uh, come up in, in this psalm tonight. Okay, well, thanks, Phil, and uh, thanks, George. Um, it might be helpful if we uh, if we read Psalm twenty six uh, to start uh, this evening. So, um, George, would you mind reading that for us, please? Psalm twenty six. Yeah, I'll read. Uh, I'll read Psalm twenty six for us, <laughs> uh, and maybe if I read it, it might get it in my head a little bit. <laughs> okay, Psalm twenty six, Psalm of David. Judge me. O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honour dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hand is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me, and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an, ev in an even place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. OK, thanks very much, George. Um, so I think it'd be useful to start off with um, looking at the background of this psalm, because that often helps um, to set the context of it. Um, one thing we can be sure about this psalm because of the, the title is that it is a psalm of uh, David. And so we can be confident on that. Um, unlike some of the other psalms, um, this one I would suggest we can be less confident about the background to it. So I'm just going to put out two suggestions um, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, Phil and George can comment on uh, which suggestion they, they think fits best or they think might fit best afterwards. Um, so the, the, first, um, the first suggestion is really focused around uh, verse eight, where there's a, a focus on God's house. So uh, David here says, Lord, I've loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honour dwelleth. And then he also talks about God's altar in verse six. So um, possibly written after David brings the ark to Jerusalem. And um, remember that was a very significant event in, in David's uh, life. Um, but that perhaps doesn't fit with the, um, the emphasis in this psalm of those that do evil um, and those that shed blood uh, or carry out bribes and David here wanting to distance him himself uh, from those that, that do this. So another suggestion is that perhaps this was written 
uh, later on in David's life when he looked back on those he'd had dealings with and he wanted to separate from, from that. Um, and there's perhaps a link with uh, the book of Deuteronomy. So um, if we look at verse or well, verse six, uh, perhaps you can just have this in your mind when we do look at a cross reference. Uh, Psalm 26, verse six, I will wash my hands in innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord. So this idea of David washing his hands in, in innocency, um, possibly a link back to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Maybe if we just have a, uh, a quick look at that. Um, this is from the law of Moses, and this is what happens if um, a body is found. So that sounds uh, uh, pretty horrendous. Um, but if um, if somebody's found dead uh, without knowing how how they've died, so uh, verse one of Deuteronomy twenty one: If one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth to possess it, so it's um, I guess we'd call it a murder inquiry. Uh, today and uh, what you'd have to do is you'd have to go to the nearest town and gather the elders and then the elders would first of all have to declare their own innocency of um, of the one that had been found slain so they would kill an animal they would uh, kill a heifer and then uh, if we come down to verse seven it says and they shall answer and say our hands have not shed this blood neither have our eyes uh, seen it be merciful O lord unto thy people israel whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood unto the people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be um, forgiven them. And they also had to wash their hands at the same time. So I'm just trying to find the uh, verse six. Uh, wash their hands over the over the heifer. So possibly this sort of link here to somebody that's connected uh, committed this terrible act. So if we were thinking of the life of David, who, who might David have been thinking of if we were to pin it down specifically? Well, an obvious candidate would perhaps be uh, Joab, um, who was uh, uh, quite a violent character in, in David's life, uh, even though he had a preeminent role in the house of David. You remember that Joab killed Abner um, almost secretly, really. He was just talking to him and then he stabbed him in the ribs, uh, Absalom, when Absalom couldn't defend himself and Absalom's hair got caught in the thicket and um, Joab um, uh, threw darts into his, um, into his heart and, and killed him. So again, pretty horrific. Uh, and he also did the same in the Massa. And then at the end of his life, David warns his son Solomon about the treachery of Joab. So possibly this reflection on the evil that had happened in his life and, and looking back uh, wanting to separate himself. So, guys, I don't know if you, if either of those uh, ideas chime with you, or uh, or if you've got any other suggestions to the background. Yeah, there's some really interesting links there. I think in that you've put put up from uh, Deuteronomy, and I guess one of those things we can't definitively know, but uh, there could even be some. I was just thinking about Joab and the altar as well that. Uh, we had mentioned about the altar. Maybe that's something we can pick up later. But uh, yeah, definitely seems a really interesting thought there. George, any well, thoughts? So yeah, I've not thought of that with the altar because that happens right at the end with Jab, doesn't it? With uh, with Solomon. But, uh, yeah, that's just a last resort before uh, Solomon then uh, follows through what David's warning was. So possibly link. Don't know. Mm. No, I think they're both quite interesting trials of thought that you, you've taken us down, Mark. And I suppose, as you've seen with other Psalms that we've thought about as, as well, when we've done this series, Phil, um, perhaps they've, they've sort of, the, the Psalms, if, if David maybe wrote them towards the end of his life, they're almost reflections on different parts that, that have happened or, or, you know, more than one episode. So I think um, they're both good suggestions. And I do like that second one, like, like you said, Phil, uh, with with the aspect of, of washing his hands of, of the bloodshed that he'd witnessed throughout his life and obviously it got me thinking about how it that was sort of one of the reasons why he couldn't build that that house for God um, because he was a man of war and uh, it was almost like David reflecting on that and and trying to bring himself closer to God which is sort of what, what this psalm is, is talking about as well isn't it yeah definitely Mm. Okay. Um, well, whilst it's interesting to look at the background to these psalms, it's 
much more important to apply these things to us today. So let's have a delve into the psalm and see if we can uh, look at the structure of it and also draw out some lessons. So uh, it's a short psalm, just the 12 verses. It's written in sort of couplets. So every verse um, is a nice succinct um, uh, words. And of course, it would have been written to be sung. And I, I really appreciated Phil's uh, music at the start there, which seemed to fit it uh, very nicely. Um, I think also that there is a, a structure in this uh, psalm, and I'm not a linguistic person at all, um, but it's uh, it's a chiastic uh, structure. I hope I've spelled that right. Um, but it's it's where the um, the first verse and the last verse is linked, and then uh, the next verse down is linked to the second to last, um, and then as you can see in the red. And then in the orange, so we're going closer and closer in. So the, the orange um, is uh, verse uh, six and verse eight of the psalm. And we'll go through this in a bit more detail. And then the caustic structure has a focus on just one phrase uh, or a couple of phrases in the middle, which is that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. And I think whilst it's in the middle of the psalm, I think that's the, the, the focus of this psalm. Um, so some of these um, caustic links are perhaps more obvious than others. Um, the ones in red are very strongly talking about the wicked and David wanting to uh, disassociate himself with that. In the orange, there's a focus on God's house and where God dwells. And um, the green and the blue is more David wanting to be um, judged by God for his actions and tried by God uh, to make sure he was going in, in, in the right way. So we'll see that sort of develop as, it, as, it, as we go through. Mm. So I hope it, that, that structure makes sense. Yeah, yeah it's fascinating, make, isn't it, Jordan? It, it really is. And uh, it, it was making me think with how you just sort of briefly summarised that, Mark. We were looking at a little acronym at the beginning called CPT, where David sort of... Um, complains pleas, and trusts in different elements of the psalms that that we were looking at and it almost um seems to to do that 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 david there's not perhaps a big push on complaints here but he is speaking of the evil people isn't he and not wanting to be associated with them and then that focus that we get in the middle seems to be that that trust and that confidence that he really hasn't got so it's interesting that we sort of looked at it as it goes down in the psalm whereas this is sort of coming in uh, which is which is really nice. Yeah. We'll keep an eye out so, for so the thought, structure in other um, psalms as well, George. I think that's a good. Now uh, Mark's introduced it. We'll keep an uh, eye absolutely. out for them. Yep. Yeah. It's a structure that the, the, the whole scripture is full of. Uh, this structure is everywhere, and I think it shows the God's hand in uh, writing the book uh, mm -hmm. because it's because uh, the way it's written in the, in this way. Um, but we'll use the the. This structure is so rather than just go verse by verse, we'll look at the blue first, so the, the first and the last verse together, and then the green and uh, end in the middle rather than at the end. Okay, so um, so we're going to have a look at verse uh, 1 and verse 12 now, which says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. And then verse 12, my foot standeth in an even place in the congregation will I bless the Lord. So um, the first thing David asks of God is that God judges him. So here, if you think of a sort of a court scene, uh, God is the magistrate and David's putting himself in the dock uh, to be judged by God. Now, I think the key that comes out for me in relation to asking God to judge us is that, that God is a fair and just judge. So he judges us on, on what we do um, and how we live our lives, irrespective of how old we are or what our background is or where we live or how much money we may or may not have. You know, all that's irrelevant uh, in God's eyes. If you just come back to Psalm 7, uh, just, just for a moment. Um, and, and this is a theme which is throughout the throughout the psalms uh, psalm 7 verse 8 says something very 
similar. Uh, the Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. So th there's no hiding here. There's no sort of clever defences uh, to get out of God's judgment. It's, um, it's according to our own righteousness our, and our own uh, in integrity. But in the knowledge that, that God uh, judges us in that way, then we can have great trust in God. So he says, I've trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. So um, it's a bit like going on a walk in the, uh, uh, in the slippery mud um, and, and being sure-footed in, in our walk. Um, the, the revised version, instead of I shall not slide, says um, and shall not waver. So it's that, it's that idea of going one way to another. Um, James says something quite interesting in, in this regard. In fact, let's have a look at this one, because I think it's worth turning this passage up, uh, James chapter 1, just in, in regard to the, the steadfastness of our trust in God, which is it's so important that we develop that characteristic in our lives. Uh, James chapter 1 and verse 6 says, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, so that's the idea of sliding, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. And uh, it's so easy in life, isn't it, to think, oh, do I need to do that or do I go that way? And you, know, you become indecisive and it plays with your mind. But if we put our trust in God, we've got something solid to, uh, to hang on to. And I think that links in nicely with the last verse uh, where it says, my foot standeth in an even place so it's, it's a similar idea of being sure-footed in uh, perhaps uncertain times really which is what we're living in today um it's just a little link with the next psalm so we are going to psalm uh, 27 now george uh, so <laughs> psalm 27 and uh and verse uh 11 says teach me thy way o lord and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies and um in the margin the plain path if I can uh, just find it, a way of plainness. Um, so, you know, we don't, we, we want something that's certain that we can latch onto. And uh, yeah, we definitely need that, uh, that in our lives uh, today. Yeah, absolutely. Any, uh... Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's such a big theme that's really come through in the life of David that when he has had those moments in like that met that picture used in James Mark of sort of feeling like, you, you know, you're not sure footed and you, you, you're on water. It's, and you, you, you're wavering. Um, when David finds those moments that he's going through in his life, um, he realizes that when he, go, when he goes to, to his God, that's, that's his refuge. That's his strong tower. And that place where he finds that steadfast, reliable love that, that his God shows him. And I think that's a really powerful lesson that we see through through these psalms um with david yeah okay let's uh let's move on and look at the the next uh pairing uh so this is verses two and three and verse 11 uh where it says examine me o lord and prove me try my reins and my heart for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes and i've walked in thy truth and then verse 11, but as for me, I'll walk in my integrity, redeem me and be merciful unto me. So this is really an extension of the judging. Um, and this is God testing the person, testing the individual in, in, our, in our lives. Um, you'll note that there's, there's three words that are used here. They're all different words in the Hebrew. Um, David asks God to examine him, to prove him, and to try him. Now, um, what's the different Hebrew words? I'm struggling to find a particular difference between examining and trying, um, but the, both of them have the idea of, of, a, of testing something, and in particular, um, the testing of, of a metal. Uh, so let's, go, let's have a look at Jeremiah chapter 9, where the, where the word's used. Um, but I think this is perhaps a helpful little anecdote for our lives um, to just to understand what we mean by testing of the metal, first of all. So Jeremiah chapter nine 
and verse uh, 7. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will melt them and try them. But how shall I do for the daughter of my people? And that word try there, it's the same word, try my reins in uh, Psalm 26. So when you melt metal or you're refining metal, it gets heated up in a furnace. It gets hotter and hotter. And then all the all the dross from the metal rises to the top and it's scooped out. But it's only by heating the metal up in the first place that you, you get that purifying Mm -hmm. um and this is picked up in uh in peter where it says that the trying of our faith and and likens it to pure gold so it's much more precious than a pure gold so when we have difficulties and times of testing in our life god's like heating us up to get rid of all the bad bits um like metal so that the the faith the pure faith of gold might might um be purified so I think that's the idea with examining and trying. And then uh, proving uh, is, a, is a similar word. It's used slightly differently in the Bible. It's the Hebrew word NASA. Um, and uh, it made me think of the you know, NASA space program and how they have to test ships, you know, spaceships, and taste, test all the facets of spaceships before they could fly rockets, otherwise they'll explode. Um, <laughs> But it, it's, it's a really interesting word, how it's used in the Bible. Um, I think we need to have a look at Genesis 22 because there's, um, there's a really important example where this word's used. And sometimes if we just read it in the English version, we get the wrong idea. Uh, so Genesis chapter 22, this is the incident of Abraham, who was a very faithful man, of course, um, when God asked him to go and offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And this incident is introduced in Genesis 22 and verse one, where it says it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, behold, here I am. And that word tempt there, it's the same Hebrew word prove in uh, Psalm 26. So it's this testing again. And, and God does put incidents in our lives, which are perhaps very challenging and very difficult for us, but it's to test us. It's to, to check our character, to see if we are going in the right way. And um, I'm sure uh, we can all think of examples in our lives where we have been tested and it's, you know, sometimes we have to be tested almost to breaking point, uh, but God, uh, God always provides a way out for us. Um, you want me, Mark, of... Um... In, in Hebrews 12, verse 6, where it says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And that always gives me a lot of comfort that in the moment it seems challenging. It's it's difficult. It's not nice as David experienced. But we, like you said, God will work with us and will bring us through this and, and, and through that. And, and we see that in, in the life of David. And it was actually for the bettering of David's character because God loved him and wanted what was best for him. So I always find that really comforting in line with what you just said. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, key verse, that, George. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, David asked God to prove him and to try his reins and his heart. Any uh, any thoughts on what the reins are? It's not a word we use very much today. No, I was associated with a horse. <laughs> yeah, that was the initial thought, I guess. That's the only thing we, maybe I'd use it today. But I guess if it's his heart as well, I was just looking in the... I've got an ESV Bible that doesn't have much more clarity on that either. Uh, it had um, heart and mind, but I don't think that's that's confusing it as well. I think I've I did notice this before, Mark, in that Psalm seven that you referred to before Psalm seven. I think you read verse eight. The following verse mentioned rains as well, and I was looking it up whilst uh, we're there. I think is it the idea of kidneys or something like that. Yeah, that's right, Phil. It's, uh, it is kidneys. Yeah, um, it's interesting the ESV has chosen to use the word minds. But yeah, it, it is kidneys. Um, and yeah, really good link with uh, with Psalm 7, uh, verse 8. Um, and it's interesting that the it mentions the kidneys before the heart. So we need to think, well, what do the kidneys do? And why is it before the heart? So um, 
again, I'm not a, a person of medicine or biology, but uh, I understand that the kidneys refine the blood, um, that if any poisonous substances in the blood, the kidneys uh, extract it. And the kidneys do that before it goes, before the blood, which is the life, goes to the heart. So just as a suggestion, maybe trying the kidneys first, maybe that's our conscience. So God testing our conscience is our conscience right first. And then, then secondly, the heart. So perhaps the heart is, oh, it's our emotions, isn't it? It's the seat of our feelings. Um, so the outworking of our emotions, it's really important that our conscience is right with God first. So I'm interested if you've got any other suggestions, but I think that's perhaps why it refers to the reins and the heart in, in that order. Well, they're definitely something very deep inside, aren't they, inside your body? So even that, at that level, when David's asking God to examine him and improve him, it's like go right under the inside and, and look in there. Um, I do remember George, uh, John Ensel did Psalm 16, and he it came up in Psalm 16 as well, where it talked about uh, 16 verse 7, I'll bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. This idea mm. of, I guess, mulling things over on inside. Um, I'm not 100% sure, I guess, about the how the kidneys fit. But if it's something that's deep inside in you that you want God to check, it's not like you're sort of obscuring it in some way. You might look clean on the outside, as Jesus often challenged some of uh, the people he talked to, but they were not clean on the inside, whereas David's asking to be checked all over, so to speak. Mm. I think we, we've got to be right inwardly to be able to walk outwardly, haven't we? I suppose the one has to reflect the other, which might explain the, ne the next bit in the verse. Uh, For thy loving kindness before my eyes, I have walked in thy truth. So there's that outward reflection of what what's, what is inside. Um, and perhaps also linking with that verse 11, but ask me, I'll walk in my own integrity. Um, and if our thoughts and emotions are right, then we will walk with integrity, even if we fail and we still do things that are, that are wrong, because there are times in life and there's examples in the Bible of this where somebody does something wrong, but they didn't know that they were doing wrong because they were still acting with integrity. So an example would have been... Um, with uh, uh, with Abraham, when uh, sorry, when Abraham went down to um, with Sarah, his wife, with, uh, to Ahimelech, and um, he said that she was his his sister, uh, and Ahimelech was going to do something that was unhonourable to to Sarah. But then he had a dream, and he said to God, like, "I've acted with integrity. I didn't know that she was Abraham's uh, wife because he told me that she was his his sister." Uh, mm, fascinating jumping about my uh, slide there. yeah it also reminds me of Psalm 78 verse 72 I remember looking at um, David and what makes him such a powerful leader and that's looking at David and why how God chose him as a shepherd which we considered in Psalm 23 didn't we George but it says so he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands that was that quality that God saw in him right from the beginning, that integrity, that being true to God and true to God's principle all the way through. Um, it seems like such a powerful thing for us to try and copy ourselves. Yeah. Okay, so, let's, uh, sorry, Jordan. No, I was just going to say, I remember on your slide, the next bit was the red part, which interested me. So uh, where does it take us next, Mark? Yeah, okay, so uh, this is all about those that we shouldn't have anything to do with in our lives. Um, so David makes this very clear distinction. I've not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I've hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Um, and then the corresponding verses in 9 and 10, gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men or men of blood, in whose hands is mischief and their right hand is, is full of bribes. The first thing that jumped out to me was the idea of sitting and going with these people. And there's um, a very clear link back to the first psalm. And you, I guess you would have started here some months ago. Uh, so Psalm 1 
and verse one blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful so um in all walks of life not to have anything anything to do uh with these people um george phil any ideas on dissemblers it's not a word we use today no, not not off the top of my head. Uh, I cheated a little bit. I, I've got an ESV Bible open as well, and it used the word hypocrites instead of dissemblers. Um, I don't know okay. if that helps, Mark. Yeah, I think it does. Strong says those that hide something, so it's right. uh, keeping something secret. And yeah, I think we could say a hypocrite would do that because he would say one thing and then mm -hmm. and then do uh, the opposite. Yeah. Uh, this made me think. Just David's so clear, isn't he, about not having anything to do with these people um you know what about us in our lives um you know, we all have to deal with people that live their lives that aren't in accordance with the way god would would want them and deliberately do that you know we all we all sin we all make mistakes but i'm sure we all know people that that actually enjoy doing things that we know from the bible are, are wrong um so you know do we have that same separation and that same hatred of evil um as david was able to say in, in his life in romans it talks about having pleasure in those that do these things so you know do we enjoy watching these things on our tvs or watching them on the internet i think perhaps a, a point for us all to uh, to, to contemplate because david uh, asked not to be counted with sinners um those men of blood uh, those, those that those that are violent uh, nor indeed those that that take bribes and um, we perhaps won't turn to it but in Exodus chapter 23 it makes it very clear that if you take a gift from somebody in a business matter or something like that then it can taint your judgment and mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to act with integrity which David was very keen to act with integrity in in his life. Mm. The complete opposite isn't it of David asking God to test his heart because these people are hiding things. They know that there's things hidden in their heart that uh, he's trying to guess, make sure that he's keep, keeping his heart in a clean way. We looked at that quite a bit, didn't we, Jordan, in our special topic on the imprecatory psalms of the way David uh, had to or chose to follow God by and how what those curses on others all meant and how that might apply. So yeah, it's coming up again here, isn't it? Absolutely. Right. So then what's the next colour, Mark? So we're now on to orange. So we're getting to the crux of the matter now. Uh, <laughs> I'll wash my hands in innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honour dwelleth. So there's a real focus on the things of God here. Um, but before we can get to God's house, before we can compass God's altar, and um, in David's time, it would have been the tabernacle, um, he had to wash his hands in innocency, which is really interesting because uh, the priests in the temple back in Exodus chapter 30, before they went and did anything in the temple, they had to go and wash their hands in the brazen, um, in, the, in the labor, which was made of brass. Uh, and it says in Exodus that they had to do that so they didn't die, that they die not. It was, it was that important. And, uh, yeah, it made me think about what the government's telling us to do today, that we have to uh, wash our hands because of the pandemic, hands, face and space, that we might die not. Um, and, you know, that's clearly important. Uh, but here we're dealing with things that are spiritual and the, this really makes us not die. You know, this is something that's eternal. And um, what that means in our lives is, is baptism, first and foremost. So uh, being baptised into the Lord Jesus Christ, washing away our sins. And then if we have been baptised, then uh, as it says in Ephesians, it's uh, there's a phrase, the washing of water, uh, washing ourselves with the word of life. So washing water uh, through God's word. Uh, so God's word is, is likened to water. So there's that continual washing. Uh, so some spiritual uh, links there. Um, sorry, George. I was just going to say uh, it's interesting. We're back at the uh, the house of God where we we looked at. I think in was it Psalm seventeen, Phil with Steph. Yeah, fifteen. Yeah, 
15, sorry. Yeah. That's right. And that was all about uh, being cleansed there as well, if you're going to go up to the house of God. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Psalm 23, wasn't it, at the end, with dwelling in the house of the Lord forever as well. Mm -hmm. Seems mm -hmm. to be a, another pattern that maybe something we've got to pick up in a later session. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Uh, there's perhaps a link here. We maybe we won't turn to it. Maybe I'll leave this as some homework, perhaps uh, mm, for people to ponder. Um, so have a read of Psalm 73. Think about the wicked, and then think about God's uh, David's focus on God's house. And in Psalm 73, it talks about going to the sanctuary of the Lord, and then you find out what happens to the wicked. So maybe a little a little link there for you to have a, a think about. Um, but David's real focus is all about God's house. So uh, back to Psalm 27, George, uh, this time verse four. Um, One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And that's all David wanted to do. He wanted to build God's house, but because he fought so many battles, that was to be reserved for his son Solomon but his entire focus was all about dwelling with God, living with God. And um, we today, we're, we're in um, communities. Um, you know, we have the meeting to go to uh, with fellow believers. Um, we're perhaps physically not able to do that because of the current pandemic, but is our desire to be in God's house and to be with our brothers and sisters today? Or have we been distracted and thinking about, um, lots of other things because David's desire was for was very much for God's house and uh, in God's house if you look at the end of verse 8 it's the place where thine honour dwelleth and usually that word honour in the Bible is translated as glory um, and God's glory is his character and we can only dwell with God uh, and have that glory with God if we exhibit that same character in, in our lives. So it sort of ties in everything that we've been looking at in the rest of this talk. Um, and then we've got the, the conclusion of the song, which is in the middle. I believe it's the conclusion. So the key verse, I think, is uh, verse 7, um, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. And I say this is the focus because of that structure that we looked at, but also to say that this is the, the very reason why God created us in the first place, um, that he wants his creation. He wants mankind to, to show praise to him. And that's, that's what we, we have to do in our lives to, to give praise to God as our creator and to thank him for all of the incredible things that he has done for us and, here this is what this is what david wants to do he wants to publish with the voice of thanksgiving uh, all the things that that god has has done um which just leaves us perhaps just with one little thought just to tie this up which does take us to the end of the psalm um the last phrase uh, verse 12 my foot standeth in even place in the congregations will i will i bless the lord and, and i just want to link these two bits together because um this word congregation, it's really interesting. It only occurs twice in the Hebrew and it means an assembly or a choir, but it's it's in the feminine. So um, it's a female assembly or choir. And when we think about that spiritually, this must be referring to, to the house of God, to the ecclesia, to the bride of Christ, because we are we're described as uh, in, in the feminine. Um, so this is David reflecting on that on that great plan and purpose. And perhaps if we just conclude by going to Revelation chapter five, um, we've got a glimpse into the future uh, when Jesus returns to set up his kingdom and that he will gather his bride to him, which is the true house of God made up of men and women. And we will have that opportunity if through God's grace we're there. Um, to praise God throughout eternity. So uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God with thy blood of every kindred and tongue and people and has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And this particular verse is talking about praise of Jesus, but we also know that there is that, that praise of God throughout eternity as well. 
Wow, so such far-reaching from the enemies of David, perhaps Joab, right through to praising God forever. Thanks, Mark. That's really powerful. So many things for us mm. to think about. And don't forget your homework, everyone, to look at Psalm 73 as well. I'm sure there's uh, going to extend even further as we look at that. So, George, what, from what we've seen so far, anything stand out for you from this psalm? I think the, the big thing that, that perhaps I need to take away, obviously, spending a little bit more time, obviously, at home with the current pandemic, I can get very easily distracted uh, procrastinating an awful lot um, and I think that the big thing for me is to try and think about my life like that and, and is the centre of my life uh, to, to praise as you've said Mark and, and give glory to God to try and have him as the focus to help me when you know the problems come when the challenges come when we are being refined as, as you, you brought out in that, that uh, metaphor um, so I think that's the, the, the thing that I'm really going to try and think about this week to to focus on God like David did and to try and, you know, mentally and spiritually dwell in his house and obviously, you know, in, in other ways as well, practically, so that I could be part of that that bride, as you spoke about in, in Revelation. So thanks again, Mark, for uh, for what, what would be the big um, your big sort of take home point, Mark, from this particular psalm? For me, it's the um, that separation from anything that's that's of evil, and I suppose if we if we push away from that, then we naturally fall towards God's house, don't we? It's that um, it's the two things, isn't it? It's leaving the world behind us and then reaching towards the goal of praising God for eternity. So um, perhaps that for me. Great. Well, thanks again for joining us, and uh, it's been. Really good to consider this psalm and uh, unpack the, the structure and the different elements that David was talking about and how they apply to us. So, yeah, thank you very much for being on our video series. And uh, thank you, everyone, who's watched this video. Uh, we really appreciate your thoughts and feedback on these on these videos, and we pray that the, uh, the thoughts from this psalm will go with you and you as you reflect on them that you might draw close to god and give him praise so until next time uh, god bless you all and thank you very much bye everyone